My name is Mikey Pasek. I'm an incoming assistant professor of psychology at the University of Illinois Chicago. And I also serve as a research fellow here at Beyond Conflict, which is convening today's event. For those of you who may be new to Beyond Conflict, Beyond Conflict is a global nonprofit that combines learning from decades of experience in conflict resolution with evidence from the brain and behavioral sciences with the goal to strengthen peace building processes around the world. It is truly my honor to be joining you today to moderate our discussion about our new report fresh off the Beyond Conflict Press entitled Renewing American Democracy, Navigating a Changing Nation. As we'll discuss in depth, this report examines the psychological underpinnings that can help us understand and perhaps most importantly address many of the challenges that are currently threatening American democratic health. If you haven't seen the report yet, you can find the report on Beyond Conflict's website, which my colleague uh, just dropped a link to in the chat. It unfortunately goes without saying that we live in a deeply divided country. Indeed, many of our current divisions can be traced right through our country's lineage and history, as we've continually striven to form a more inclusive and representative democracy, a democracy in which liberty and justice are realized for all. But from the recent mass shootings in Buffalo in Texas, to fierce debates causing upheaval at local school boards across the country, to the insurrection that took place on the steps of the Capitol building, it's clear we have much, much more work to do to realize this vision. It's our sincere hope that the report we'll be discussing today will accomplish two primary goals. First, we hope that it helps to translate a rich body of academic work from psychologists, political scientists, and sociologists, just to name a few of the social science disciplines, into digestible insights that can help us all make sense of the deep identity-based division that's currently threatening our democratic health. For example, we'll talk in, about how the fears that lead to conspiratorial great replacement theory feed directly into a narrative of identity or status threat, a term that we psychologists use to explain the psychology of traditionally advantaged group members who feel like their group is losing status or standing or privilege in society. We'll also discuss how deep-seated inequality can similarly trigger threat for members of marginalized groups, people who've never really had a seat at the American table in the first place. But as I said, more than just diagnose some of the drivers of our discord, we hope that this report and our discussion today does something else. We hope that it offers an evidence-based path out with our best bets from the science about how we can overcome division and rescue our democracy from the brink. Today, you'll hear from a leading psychologist, Dr. Linda Trapp from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And you'll also hear from conflict resolution practitioners, including Beyond Conflict's own Tim Phillips and Michelle Barsa, as well as Wendy Felice from the Center for Inclusion and Belonging at the American Immigration Council. Following remarks from our panel, we'll open it up for a Q&A. And I really do encourage each of you to join us for this dialogue. Please feel free to ask questions at any time by entering them in the chat box. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of the event. I also want to note that today's conversation is on the record and it's being recorded and we'll be happy to share this recording as well. To get us started, I want to introduce my colleague, Tim Phillips, founder and CEO of Beyond Conflict. Tim is a pioneer in the field of conflict resolution and reconciliation and is globally recognized for his contributions to peace and reconcilia reconciliation efforts in several countries, including Northern Ireland, South Africa, and El Salvador. As the CEO and founder of Beyond Conflict, Tim has led efforts to bring insights and research from the brain and behavioral sciences to issues of social conflict and social change worldwide. Welcome, Tim. Uh, thank you, Mikey. And it's, uh, I, I, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and I want to thank my colleagues who you'll be hearing from shortly. But I want to give a shout out to Mikey Pasek, who was really instrumental in helping sort of conceive this particular initiative you'll be hearing about today. And then, of course, my colleague, Michelle Barsa. So uh, a bit about Beyond Conflict. This is our 30th anniversary as an organization, and we have spent most of the last 25 years working in countries around the world, trying to make a transition from dictatorship to democracy or conflict to peace. 
and our methodology approach was quite a humble one in the sense that we didn't come in with a particular theory of change. We came in with the view that people can live, learn from the lived experience of others. That others who never imagined there could be change in their own country, that apartheid could end peacefully, or that you can end the Northern Ireland conflict, or that you could reconcile after the wars in Central America, um, found the value in hearing from others who struggled with those sort of transformations and changes. And so that's been the core approach for many years. And then about a decade ago, we started looking at brain and behavioral science because we recognized there were so many intractable conflicts, so many fragile peace agreements, and so many thought to be well-established democracies like the United States that were facing serious democratic threats. So uh, we started focusing on polarization in the United States after the 2016 election. It was clear to us that polarization was certainly worsening and resembled many of the sectarian and identity-based conflicts we had seen in other countries around the world. In fact, many of those leaders would tell me over the last 10 to 15 years that we should focus more on the United States and less abroad because they could sense the dynamics that we are now struggling with in the United States based on their experience. So in 2020, working with brain and behavioral scientists at the University of Pennsylvania, we released a report, America's Divided Mind, which is the one you'll see on your left, which focused on the psychology of deepening polarization and found that polarization was indeed becoming more identity-based. And one of the things we know from brain and behavioral science is when polarization becomes identity-based, a whole range of unconscious psychological processes come online that just work to drive us further apart. And we saw that it resembled a lot of these identity-based conflicts that we saw around the world. And one of the key things that I learned, for example, going into Northern Ireland in the early 90s, the assumption that it was a religious-based conflict quickly faded when learning from people in Northern Ireland that it was fundamentally about identity and consistently found that in many conflicts around the world. So following the 2020 election um, and after this initial report we did, it was clear to us that polarization was worsening and American democracy was facing the biggest threats, threats since the American Civil War. And we also recognized that this deepening identities based polarization was also being shaped by fear. And the question we had is fear of what? Not just what we assumed on the surface, but what were the psychological dynamics that were being shaped not only by increasing identity-based polarization, but fear, and how that Fear was also shaping and being shaped, our psychology being shaped and shaping this deepening divide we were facing. So this past year, we launched an initiative to better understand those psychological forces and convene leading social scientists, as you can see on this slide, and practitioners to learn from their research and experience and to ask for recommendations for action. My colleagues, Linda and Michelle, will discuss those findings in greater detail. And as you can see, we were lucky to convene some of the most respected scholars in the social sciences, from political science, uh, and social psychology, to ask about their research in status threat and identity threat, and how do they think it's driving our current disunity and divide. It's very clear that American democracy is under profound threat from multiple directions. We face serious challenges across core divides that actually pay no attention to a political affiliation or allegiances. The pandemic impacted all of us in ways and didn't ask the question, are you a liberal, conservative, Democrat, or Republican? The same with climate change, the same with violence in its many manifestations. And it's clear to us as beyond conflict and many of our colleagues who are from the lay but deeply experienced world of conflict resolution, that we need to learn what brain and behavioral science tells us about what it is to be human and how our psychology shapes our unconscious thoughts and behavior. We also must understand that our assumptions about others are often shaped in ways that distort reality and undermine our, our best interest. And again, my colleagues will get into that. But in the end, we also must understand what I learned and my colleagues learned in Northern Ireland, South Africa, and other countries. The lessons they learned, painful lessons they learned in the aftermath of violent conflict was that they could only share, solve the shared problems they faced together. And the other key thing they learned is they could only protect what was sacred to them as individuals and communities, whether it be their religion, their cultural identity, their identity as members of communities uh, and nations, when they recognized what was sacred 
to the identities of others around them. And so I would hate it as an American to find our country learning this lesson after further deepening conflict um, and a democratic decline in our country. If we can learn anything from abroad is they, if they could rewind their clocks, would ask us, do not demonize each other, understand each other. They eat up what we can learn from brain and behavioral science and wish they knew it then. And now it makes them better understand their situation and the current challenges they face. So we should and need to learn more from social psychology and, and the broader brain and behavioral sciences, but also the lived experience of others abroad and in our own country. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mikey and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Tim. Um, as always, I feel like you put into words better than most of us can, the critical time that we find ourselves in. We're, we're in a moment that many of us didn't think the United States was gonna be in, and unfortunately, <laughs> that many people knew the United States would be in as well. You highlight not only the moment, but also our critical need to bridge science and practice, um, to learn from an ever-evolving body of research. And this is something that beyond conflict under your leadership um, really does extraordinarily well. So to, to do that, as we think about the science, what I'd like to do is introduce Dr. Linda Trapp, a professor of social psychology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who co-chaired Beyond Conflict's US Policy Advisory Group, which spearheaded this initiative. Linda is a world-renowned expert on cross-group relations and brings to us decades of experience studying how to bridge differences in divided societies and how contact between groups can be leveraged to reduce prejudice and advance social change. Perhaps more impressively, Linda is a leading translational scientist who not only conducts cutting edge research, but who also models for younger academics like myself how those of us in the quote unquote ivory tower can extend their reach beyond academia to learn from and provide insights to organizations and practitioners doing the real on the ground work to bridge differences in divided societies. So Linda, I wanna start by asking you a, a very simple question. What does the science really say about the psychological roots of our political discord and social division? Thanks, Linda. Well, first, um, thank you so much for that incredibly gracious and kind introduction, Mikey, as well as for moderating today's session. And I, I think you pose a great question or a good starting point about the psychological roots of social division. Clearly, you know, as Tim has already remarked, social division has been growing in the U.S., and it comes from many interrelated sources, including political polarization. And in particular, I would emphasize that there are deeply divergent views on many issues in our society, whether it's ranging on uh, from debates about gun reform to abortion to voting rights to whether and how we can talk about race in our schools. And these divergent views are not only fueled by high levels of anger and hostility by many citizens and individuals within the US population, but increasingly, I think we see that political party leaders have become more willing to support extreme measures that seem perhaps more designed to appeal to that increased anger and hostility than to necessarily create effective legislation that can try to move our country forward in addressing some of these social problems that we face. And here is precisely where I think it's really useful for us to understand the psychology of social division because basically what happens when we see ourselves and others as members of different social categories or social groups, um, I, I fear that we'll only be able to really make progress in addressing our nation's problems by recognizing these identities and the, their importance, by recognizing that we're not simply talking about gun control or abortion or other social policies, but we're actually contending with fundamental issues about identity, who we are as members of our social groups and who we are as representatives of our social groups. And so, you know, I use that as a starting point to respond to your question about the science and the psychology of social division because decades of rigorous research studies have shown that a number of things happen when we begin to see ourselves and others as members of social groups. Some of these changes involve how we think, more of our cognitive processes or how we see people as members of social categories. And some of these changes involve how we feel, such as 
you know, our emotional responses or our motivations in contending with difference or with members of other groups. So in part, when we start to see ourselves and others as members of social groups, one thing that happens is we tend to exaggerate and accentuate differences between our groups so that we can more clearly delineate between us and them, who we are and who they are. And because as human beings, you know, we have these deeply rooted needs for safety and security, that the more we accentuate or exaggerate those differences between us and them, the easier it becomes for us to see those others as a threat to us. And that can be whether that means we see them as a threat in terms of our access to material resources or as a threat to our way of life or to our worldviews or to how we think the world should be. So in our minds, once we start to categorize or think about people in us and them terms, um, we start to exaggerate distinctions between us and them. And whether we're consciously aware of it or not, that category distinction motivates us to protect our group and our own group interests and worldviews. And that can lead to a cascade of other changes or shifts in how we think and how we feel, including things like adopting us versus them mindsets that lead us to frame relations with other people now that we're seeing them as group members in more competitive terms, such as zero sum frames where, um, you know, outcomes that are better for them means worse outcomes for us. And where we become more focused on winning, such as winning arguments or battles, rather than seeking understanding across group lines or perhaps, or perhaps working toward compromise. There are also just many basic ways in which we might simply be biased more in favor of members of our own groups compared to how we feel towards other groups and that we tend to like and trust people who are like us or more like us more than we tend to like and trust people who are like them or members of other groups. We also tend to be more generous and give greater benefit of the doubt to people from our own groups compared to how we treat members of other groups. And we also tend to see the, the views and concerns and perspectives of members of our own groups as just a bit more valid and legitimate compared to the concerns and perspectives of other groups. And so correspondingly, we can think about how all these factors contribute to our tendency to be motivated to support our own group, its welfare and its leaders, and to justify our own group's actions, even in cases where we might cause harm to others, because we tend to believe that we have legitimate or valid reasons for doing what we do in the face of threats that are posed by those others. And so I'm sure you can imagine how all these tendencies are ever more exacerbated the more that people see other groups through the lens of threat, either born from how much or how strongly they identify with their groups and or the circumstances or broader environment that they're in that make uh, their ability to achieve their life goals more trying or more challenging. Because the more threatened we feel and the more we attribute those feelings of threat to the presence or existence of other groups, the more likely we are to presume the worst about them, blame them for all the problems that we face, see them as evil or as ruining our society or our way of life, and the less likely we are to show compassion or empathy for their lived experiences or basic concern for their well-being or welfare as if something inside of us is saying, well, why should I care about them? They're posing a threat to us. They're against us or perhaps taking things away from us. But unfortunately, rather than trying to ease these group tensions that are born from threat, we're trying to reduce those feelings of threat to, to reduce the intensity of conflicts between groups in our society. It appears that these uh, psychological responses and feelings of threat have really been exploited by a number of people who seek to promote certain social or political agendas. For example, by preying on people's fears and concerns and feelings of threat such that they feel all the more that they need to protect themselves and their groups from external forces like other groups. Or perhaps by framing policy debates as if members of other groups are the problem because they're evil, um, rather than necessarily recognizing that part of the problem we have to contend with is the divisive and competitive nature of the context, social and political context we now find ourselves in and in which we live. And so 
these tendencies towards social division are further reinforced by not only rhetoric from political leaders or messages uh, conveyed through the media, but also just in terms of the social structure we live in, that we have such high levels of segregation between groups in our society, such that members of different groups end up having relatively few direct opportunities to engage with each other across lines of difference. And through these segmented media environments we have, or sometimes referred to as information echo chambers, such that we end up with very different understandings of current policy debates or current events, because they're often framed in ways that are consistent with and therefore serve to reinforce or legitimize our pre-existing worldviews. And so as a consequence, you know, people from different groups who live in largely different communities may end up relying more on these abstract ideas or stereotypes, more hollow conceptions of who or what people in other groups are like, rather than being able to rely on direct firsthand experiences that would allow them to develop richer or more comprehensive views of those other people, recognize their full humanity, or really know what people in those other groups are like, and you know, in ways that could actually facilitate both our willingness and our capacity to come together to solve common problems. Um, so I think I will stop there. Thank you, Wenda. Um, as always, you're excellent at doing a clear and concise and digestible overview of the science. I feel like it's like a living textbook, <laughs> but much more exciting than any of that would be. What strikes me about the overview you gave um, is both that you outline this us versus them psychology that I think most of us are familiar with, but you break down how it's much more than that. Um, how it's fueled by segregation and echo chambers, and in turn, that it fuels threat, competitive victimhood, and zero-sum thinking, these types of psychological processes that contribute to the extreme toxic nature of our current climate, and that make it easier for politicians to sow division. And as I reflect on what you say, one of the things that strikes me is that you use the term group somewhat in the abstract. You speak to how these group level processes are broad. They can apply to any groups to which we belong. And as I think about our report and one of the lessons to me, it's that these groups are also becoming so intertwined. Um, to think about our political groups as unfortunately becoming one and the same with where we live, what our race is, what our religion is. We can just think about the compounding nature of all of those group level processes and just how toxic a psychological process it can lead to. But more than diagnosis, one of the things that makes me so excited about this initiative is that a report doesn't just review the science for the purpose of writing a theoretical paper that might appear in a paywall journal article that will be read by literally a handful of academics, but that we try to do so in a way that bridges from science to practice. And that leads me to pose a, a pretty broad question uh, to Michelle Barsa, who I'm excited to introduce. Michelle is the lead author of this report and deserves a ton of credit for shepherding it through. She's also um, the director of Beyond Conflict's Democracy and Social Identity Program. Michelle has nearly 20 years of experience as a conflict resolution practitioner and has designed and implemented programming in countries ranging from Afghanistan to Guatemala to the Philippines before ultimately refocusing here in the US, which tells us a lot about our current state in 2017. Michelle, we've been engaged in a deep conversation for over a year. And one of the things that I personally admire a lot about you is your drive and ability to read the science with an eye toward designing evidence-based interventions that we can actually put to use in the now um, to try to make a difference when we need it. As Linda discussed, the science is clear about what's driving the problem, but less clear about what we do about it. So I'd love to learn more about um, how you approached with a practitioner perspective in mind, taking the science and translating it into interventions and the pathways to intervention that are actually outlined in the report itself. Yeah, thanks so much, Mikey. Um, I guess it goes without saying that defining remedies for how to contend with the psychology behind America's social divisions is not exactly a clear cut exercise and that there's no single response that can address all of the causes at once. And the responses we can deploy are, of course, interdependent and interconnected. 
um, further complicating the issue, like you just mentioned, the scientific evidence base is rather thin when it comes to identifying ways to measurably reduce social status threat and competitive victimhood. But the question we tried to ask was, if you come at division and democracy through the lens of psychology, and you think about repair and strengthening democratic practice, how might that differently shape our understanding of priority areas for intervention? Um, and one thing I want to be clear about at the outset is that the report attempts to fill a gap, um, acknowledging that um, quite a bit of the democracy promotion work that happens often does not meaningfully account for social identity. But what is outlined in the report is not intended to be a substitute or replacement for the critical ongoing work that seeks to identify and remedy structural drivers of, uh, drivers of democratic decline. Um, instead, the analysis is meant to complement those efforts and enhance their chances of success. So zeroing in on what it would take to create an enabling environment for that change um, by engaging with the psychology. So to that end, we landed on four primary areas of intervention, which you can see here on the screen. Um, within each of those areas, there are actions to be taken at the individual, collective, state, and federal levels. Um, in the report, we do focus primarily at the communal and collective in the communal and collective spheres, um, the local side of the work, though there are relevant structural and systemic remedies within each of the categories. Um, I should also say that nothing in the report is overly prescriptive and that was by design. Um, but let me take a minute to walk, um, walk folks through each of the, the areas. So starting with factualism and partisan sorting, this refers, partisan sorting refers to how Americans political affiliations are now subsumed into polarized mega identities in which identities like white, Christian, uh, conservative, capitalist are stacked under a Republican partisan mega identity and seen in opposition to identities like minority, liberal, secular, leftist that are stacked under the democratic uh, partisan mega identity. Ideological positions, policy positions can also become stacked and cemented in this way um, when the partisan sorting occurs to the extent that it has right now, people come to believe that there's an incompatibility between their partisan identity and divergence from the ideological party norm. So for example, uh, people may believe that being a quote unquote good Republican is incompatible with support for comprehensive gun reform. And so even if they as an individual believe and support um, comprehensive gun reform, they may not express those views openly for fear of being excluded um, from the group or being seen as a bad um, Republican or partisan group member. So the question then becomes, how do you create more space for individuals rather than parties to differ in their political opinions, which was the, the starting point for how we started thinking about the inter intervention pathways. Um, and we, we looked at um, in the report at how to construct identities that transcend groups. So whether they be cross-cutting identities like being a parent, caregiver, or sports fan, um, or broader superordinate identities like um, what it means to be an American. But um, importantly, we try to look at how to cultivate these cross-cutting identities and build these bridges in a way that is responsible, in a way that integrates what we know from the science about what works um, and um, particularly to emphasize the importance of considering whether intra-group work um, to reduce levels of perceived threat may be necessary as a precursor to the cross-group or intergroup work that we tend to rush to in these moments of urgency. Um, we also suggest the potential utility of shifting electoral methods used um, to those that may encourage cross-party coalitions and reduce reliance on partisan affiliations in the voting process, which is happening now um, quite a bit at the state level, like with the movement toward the use of ranked choice voting, for example. Um, in terms of residential segregation and information echo chambers, which has come up quite a bit, um, in almost every aspect of our lives, Americans are currently segregated from each other in both physical and virtual spaces across lines of race, ethnicity, education, income, political partisanship, most you name it. Um, and some of this is our own bias, like Linda mentioned, and self-selection toward living around people who are like us. Um, some of this is a legacy of discriminatory policies like redlining, and some of this is actively shaped and codified through policies like gerrymandering. Um, but think about the impact of segregation on, for example, electoral politics. Uh, the more homogenous the district, the less incentive there is for elected officials or those running for office to represent or help to reconcile diverse needs and diverse viewpoints. 
um, constituencies that perceive high levels of identity threat are more likely to see um, political or bipartisan compromise as a danger to their survival and well-being, which limits the ability to negotiate agreement and engage in the business of governing, governing but worse, it, incent it incentivizes some of the extreme positioning that has come to define our politics and defining interventions to overcome those incentives um, is tough. Uh, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, it's also important to remember that threat impacts the salience of information. Um, when we feel threatened, we're more likely to see threat in the information we consume, even if it's not objectively there. So you couple this with the information echo chambers where you hear the same messaging reinforced over and over again. And it's not hard to see how this feeds the spread of conspiratorial beliefs, right? Another major impediment to designing interventions. But in terms of how we came at interventions, um, you know, with issues like information echo chambers, much of the solution lies with policy change, but addressing the psychology offers options that may help build individual resilience to misinformation and disinformation um, by effectively reducing threat perception. And with the extent of physical segregation, we need to think both creatively and systematically about how to bring different identity groups together, since those interactions won't occur naturally as they otherwise would in an integrated community. Um, we need to think not just about social inclusion, inclusion, but also political inclusion and cross-party engagement. Um, and again, the level of perceived threat matters and should impact how these types of bridge building activities are structured, which is something we try to address and outline in the report. Uh, okay, on divergent racial attitudes and um, support for racial equity. Some things that we know, for example, the average black family in the US earns about 60% of what the average white family earns. Uh, the average white family has roughly 10 times the wealth of the average black family. And still the data is startlingly clear that Americans perceptions of the racial wealth divide are systematically wrong, that people dramatically underestimate the extent of the gap. There is a predominant belief that our nation has made far more progress toward reducing racial inequality than it actually has. This is something that Jennifer Richardson refers to as the mythology of racial progress. But how does what people think affect the pursuit of racial equality in practice? Well, if people think communities of color have come farther than they have in reality and are more well off than they actually are, then there is less demand and support for racial equity focused policy change that would advance needed structural reform. But awareness raising efforts that attempt to increase support for policy change by highlighting evidence of racial inequality tend to backfire. So rather than leading people to question the policies, practices, and institutions that give rise to these stark disparities, uh, increasing fact-based awareness can lead people to reason that the disparity is an outcome of an individual's failure to achieve rather than the result of a flawed or biased system. This is connected to a psychological process of system justification or the tendency to defend and justify aspects of the societal status quo um, which often happens at the, the level of unconscious awareness. So we won't have time to get into the specifics today, but there is a ton that the science tells us about how to shape communications and engagement around identity-based discrimination in a way that can help people move away from essentialist beliefs and tie historical injustice to present day inequality in a way that may make more space for contending with the moment of racial reckoning that we find ourselves in. Um, people have a fundamental psychological need to see themselves as good, moral, competent, and this all factors into how we approach intervention. Ultimately, one of the primary takeaways from this study um, is that perceptions of threat can actively interfere with most well-intentioned efforts to promote dialogue, deliberation, or justice. Uh, this infographic here depicts different types of intervention pathways that may get us closer to building support for racial equity. Um, and I, I wanted to flag it here because we intentionally included this intervention set uh, last in the report uh, because perceptions of threat will most definitely interfere with the majority of what we propose here. And it may be necessary to begin with the interventions outlined earlier in the port, report, some of the intergroup um, work some of the cross group relationship building before moving to some of these more um, direct interventions. But the main point I want to leave folks with is that in order to increase the effectiveness of how we intervene to address social division and democratic decline in the US, we need to think more intentionally about perceived threat and phase interventions accordingly. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Michelle. Um, one of the things that I, I think you did a really nice job of doing is 
helping to make clear that while on face value we're talking about political polarization, we're actually talking about something much deeper. We're talking in large part because of the way in which our political identities have become confounded through segregation with our racial and religious identities and where we live, that the intervention strategies we need to use to really address polarization and democratic decline rest on a deeper social psychology of how we get along as people who belong to different groups, whether it be race or religion or where we live or our culture in the United States. And that at the heart of our division are really these century old questions dating back to our country's founding. I think you do a tremendous job of distilling scientific insights into evidence-backed strategies that we can use to design implementable programs. So we're not just studying the problems, but we're actually intervening. And I hope that if there are practitioners on the call today, there's some lessons that you might be able to put to use ASAP. And I encourage you to read the report for some more detailed descriptions of some of the really clever and creative intervention strategies backed by the science and informed by our idea of what should work that Michelle helped pull together. We're really lucky to be joined today by Wendy Felice, who is honestly one of the best in the business of putting science-backed strategies to work. Wendy is the founding director of the Center for Inclusion and Belonging at the American Immigration Council, where she oversees the culture and narrative change programs that support the council's work to shape how Americans think about and act towards immigrants. Wendy, um, as you've listened to Tim lay out the vision and the mission of the report and this broader initiative, to Linda outline the science and to Michelle discuss how we can begin to translate that science into implementable intervention strategies, I'd really love to learn more from you about the insights that you take away from the report and today's discussions. As an expert interventionist, how might the report influence your work and how might others incorporate the work into theirs? Thanks. Thanks, Mikey. It's great to be with you all today. Um, this discussion on the psychology of threat and social division really is nowhere more present than on the issue I work on, immigration. It's an issue where zero-sum thinking drives the debate and a carefully constructed us versus them narrative has taken root. This is not unique to the United States, of course. The dividing lines around migration are being drawn all over the globe. Migrants are being dehumanized in the rhetoric, and the issue is being exploited for political gain in many places. And that's precisely because it is so easy to activate the threat, um, the psychology of threat and division around migration. Um, let me first start by saying I really value deeply the psychological research that has been done here and in other places. Because after working on this complex issue for more than a decade, I came to realize that the public opinion research on which we were relying wasn't really giving us a full picture of public attitudes. Public opinion polling generally explains the what, but not the why. It tells you what position people hold on immigration, but not how closely or deeply they hold it. Traditional polling is also unable to suggest or evaluate meaningful interventions. That's why I believe we need deep psychological research to guide us as we navigate this moment. And I hope more practitioners start to value it and pay more attention to it. Our inability to pass productive new immigration laws is only one example of how a toxic form of polarization has rendered us unable to find common ground and fix the problems that face our nation. Congress knows how to write legislation. In fact, we've had two bills that came close to passage in 2007 and 2013. However, today I believe we're further away from good policy on immigration and more divided on the issue than we've been in years, precisely because many of the dynamics that are explained in this report, namely increased levels of residential segregation are creating a geographic sorting that is cutting us off from knowing each other, our zero-sum thinking and fears around status threat are leading us to believe that when an immigrant or other groups, not our own, win rights or anything else, that our group loses out. This is compounded by the fact that we're holding our positions on things like immigration as sacred and non-negotiable. And we may also believe that holding that position is actually key to membership and belonging in our own social and political in-groups. All of this together makes people less likely to move or change their thinking, even when confronted with new facts and data. 
So with all these dynamics at play that, that we've just gone over in this report, where do we go from here? How do we begin to fix this? How do we reconnect people? How do we ease those feelings of threat? And how do we create the culture and the conditions for good policies? Well, one really important way to do that is featured in the report, and it's what I'm mostly here to talk about, which is facilitating positive intergroup contact. Done well, this will help us reconnect across our segregated lives, challenge and complicate our views of things by getting to know more people across lines of difference, and find common ground through our shared identities that are less polarized. So what does this look like in practice? Well, we need to build all opportunities that we can to connect people in the places where they are still coming together and crossing group divides. These are houses of worship, workplaces, schools, sports fields, libraries, and any other place that naturally brings people together, diverse groups of people together, working on shared goals that have a mutually beneficial outcome. The type of intergroup interventions I'm working on sit in sports leagues, community farms and gardens, in beekeeping groups, and land development charrettes, just to name a few. These types of programs allow people to find and connect over their common identities as gardeners, footballers, and beekeepers. And as the team explained, we believe these kinds of interventions can significantly reduce prejudice over time and plant the seeds for meaningful social cohesion that prepares us to later sit at other problem solving tables together. We must seriously ramp up the number of organizations who can engage in intergroup contact that bridges divides and can help cement new attitudes and behaviors. There are indeed many organizations today that bridge divides, but they often ask people to show up as and focus on their most polarized identities, political or religious identities, for example, and then dive into deliberative and respectful conversations to build civility and to identify common ground. But what I'm suggesting here is something else. I'm suggesting that we help people find new, less polarizing common group identities. It's not a replacement for traditional bridge building work that I just mentioned, but it is meant to be an option for those who would not opt in to difficult or anxiety producing bridge building activities, which by my estimates is a lot of people. Building out intergroup contact strategies in the places and community where we naturally meet and connect is key to creating new forms of civic friendship and problem solving and deeper engagement among cross uh, group divides. An investment in this will help break the cycle of toxic polarization on immigration and potentially re-energize cooperation and problem solving across a host of other intractable issues. So bravo to Tim and Michelle and Beyond Conflict for this new report um, and for helping bring greater understanding to the psychological dynamics that underlie our current state of toxic polarization and for bringing Dr. Linda Tropp, one of the most generous and influential social psychologists working on intergroup conflict today. I'll end there, Mikey, and pass it back to you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, in a time where, I know I don't speak for myself, but where many of us feel bleak about the level of social discord, the health of our democracy, a lot. Um, hearing people like you who are doing on the ground work listen to the science, put it to practice in a way that no scientist could, um, is really inspirational and uplifting. Um, and I feel like one of the things that makes me feel much more optimistic about our country is knowing that these types of partnerships exist um, and that people like you are out there um, doing the work. So thank you. Um, as we move on, we're entering the question and answer period um, of our conversation. And I have um, a couple questions I wanna ask and I encourage people to please ask questions in the chat as I see a few of you have already done. Um, we have about 15 minutes, we'll do our best to answer all of the questions um, that we can. But I wanna start with a question for Tim. Um, our conversations uh, really began about this report on January 6th. Um, we were working on a lot of uh, intervention strategies about polarization. And one of the things that I find kind of interesting is we actually haven't used the term political polarization very much in our conversation today, but our report is about division and democracy. And I'm curious because I feel like you 
have done so much thinking about where do we go as an organization that cares about democracy? How did January 6th change your perception? And in the year and a half since that, that we've engaged in these conversations, I'd love to learn kind of what new insights or what might have surprised you as we took a real deep dive um, into the science. Uh, well, thank you, Mikey. And I want to thank everybody for a great presentation. I guess I'll answer that in two ways. One is based on my experience over 30 years around the world, and then based on what the research and the dynamics here have shown me. Um, one of the key things that I've learned, and we've worked in dozens of countries, is at the end of the day, conflict is driven by exclusion, and it's often identity based. And it's those competing identities and feeling of being excluded from any sense of power, access, or just treated with respect and dignity can often drive people into not only deep polarization, but violence and armed conflict. Um, but I also saw that in many of these countries that went through a process of armed conflict, as they come out the other side, they realized that violence never worked, that it all only added more suffering upon suffering. And the only way to show, share and solve problems in a deeply divided country, where there are differences on race, ethnicity, gender, religion, interests, you name it, is through coming together to sh solve those shared problems. And I could see the same dynamic happening in this country. And so from a pr personal level, as a professional level, the 30 years of work around the world should at a minimum prepare me and us as an organization and others to say, what can we learn from that before we get much further down the road of deep division and conflict. And the other thing is we started looking at brain and behavioral science 10 years ago, as I mentioned earlier, because it was clear that we were missing something profound about the human experience. And that if we didn't understand human cognition and emotion, then we'll never solve whether it's conflict or deepening division or frankly, any other problem we face as a species because most of the problems we face are created by humans. And therefore we need to understand how human psychology works. And then after January 6th, I never imagined that I would see an event like that. And we were having conversations and, and I think Michelle is as well about, we did this report six, seven months ago on the psychology of polarization, but we also found through the research and many perceptions that people are overestimating by half how far Americans were apart from each other on profound issues and issues of like and dislike. But something else is happening here. And I think it was you, Mike, that said, we need to understand fear. Fear of what was my question? Is it fear of just cultural and demographic change? Is it fear driven by increasing economic inequality? But not just see fear through the lens of, well, that's how they think, or they're afraid of losing power. But what does it mean psychologically? And one of the things I've learned from my colleagues in brain and behavioral science is, you know, our brain's primary objective is to keep us alive. And being attuned to threats to our status as individuals, as families and communities and our identities is absolutely essential. And so we can see, for example, an explosion of marriage equality or transgender as people trying to protect and have their identities recognized and validated and supported and given the space to express who they are. You don't have to see these in left, right, or center. These are human needs. And if we don't understand and unpack the basic human desire to feel safe in the world and understood in the world as they see themselves, we will never navigate the challenges we're facing as a country. So that's why I turn to the brilliance of people like you, Mikey, Linda, Wendy, Michelle, and others, and people in this group to really try to understand this, because otherwise this existential threat will just get worse. Thanks, Sam. Um, I feel like you naturally bridged to a question um, that Henry posed in the Q&A, and I'm gonna kind of morph it a little bit. I hope I get your question right here, but Linda, um, Tim spoke about perception and Henry also asked about perception. And I'm curious for your take as a psychologist, because we study perception much more than we study reality in many ways. Um, how do we understand threat perceptions versus threats that are real? And as we think about interventions, What's more important um, as we think about kind of moving from perception to reality and back again? And, and is there any way that we can kind of focus on perceptions as an intervention strategy um, if they don't necessarily match how some of us see the world? Oh, gosh. Perceptions and perceptions of threat are such a huge issue. And in fact, in other work on 
uh, for example, white Americans' willingness to be supportive of racial and ethnic diversity, it's oftentimes the perception of threat as compared to any actual threat um, that is really driving their attitudes. And so if we don't pay attention to people's perceptions of the world and how those perceptions get formed, I think we're going to be at a real disadvantage in terms of addressing the fundamental issues that we're hoping to address. It's not enough to simply say, you know, no, your version of reality isn't true because it feels true to them, whether through socialization, through information that they've been exposed to in the media. And so we have to find ways to have more inputs into that social system that they're a part of. So I think this is part of why, you know, as Michelle was describing, you know, there's such a, a, a challenge that's presented at a societal level with respect to information echo chambers, right? Because we have different sources of information that we rely on to know what is true. Then when we come together, <laughs> we believe we know the truth, a truth, you know, but we think it's the truth. And then we try to relate to other people who have a fundamentally different understanding of reality. And that, you know, whether it's through that information that's been given, and also I'd say it's a similar process through our socialization. One thing I say to my students more often <laughs> every semester is that our views of the world are a function of our lived experience. And so if you take the perspective of people of color who regularly encounter on a day-to-day -day basis, different forms of discrimination or microaggressions. And, you know, they're trying to explain, in some cases, their experiences to a white person in this country. You know, on the one hand, it's not surprising that that white person will say, you know, really? Like, I don't experience that. But what's problematic is that there's not space for these different versions of reality to both coexist and to both be considered as valid and true. And so I think that's you know, that's where I look to possible structural changes in terms of, you know, how we transmit information to try to have more grace as we seek to build bridges across group lines to recognize that our version of reality isn't the only version of reality, that we may hold some things in common, but we also might have really different sets of experiences or exposure to very different sets of information that might lead us to different conclusions about why things are the way they are. And in the absence of those inputs, we tend to blame the person who's in front of us or the representative of that group as compared to recognizing the system and the Im impacts of the system that we're in. Thank you, Linda. I think one of the things that I know we've talked about a lot and that your remarks bring to light for me is that there's always a challenge between understanding and validating. Um, and I think one of the key insights from this report is if we're going to move beyond our division, we have to understand each other's perspectives. We have to engage with them in an earnest way. That's the only way to move forward. That doesn't necessarily mean we have to agree with them, but we do have to not increase threat in a way that closes conversation and that sows more discord. Um, I think we have time for two more questions, and I have one question that's been posed in the chat that I'd like to pose uh, to Michelle and then to Wendy uh, that build off of each other. So Michelle, to you, um, you've done a lot of reading of the social scientific literature, and one of the things we've talked a lot about is how do we create these broader, what we call superordinate identities, kind of identities from which we're nested into. Do you have any ideas about the types of identities that might be best suited for creating super identities to help bring us together? And that's a question that Raihan asked. I think the answer to that question probably depends on the group that you're talking about. I think that part of what I really walked away with after all, uh, this year plus of research is that we have to be segmenting these interventions and targeting them according to the extent to which people perceive threats to their core identities. And we need to figure it out from there. With folks who have higher levels of perceived threat, start with things that are more innocuous. Like we all love the same sports team. We all are, we're both parents, we're both caregivers. But um, I think, you know, importantly, the science also shows that you need to have some sort of common definition of even those more innocuous identities for, for it to work. I think there is there has been a default as of late in talking about the, the reconstruction of the superordinate American identity. Um, and I think, you know, in, in an ideal, yes, that's where we would go. I think we also see some emerging evidence that the American identity as it's currently conceptualized is highly associated with um, 
white Christian norms and identity and definitions of identity that may be limiting in terms of how other folks can see themselves um, as uh, part of that communal whole in a way that actually overcomes zero sum thinking and us versus them narrative. So I think really what this is about is um, transforming away from this false binary of our collective identities as being either like full assimilation as explaining or conceptualizing our identities in opposition to one another. Um, and I think we really need a new framework for understanding how people can both retain the identities that are so core and important to them while also embracing um, a broader superordinate identity. And I think incrementally we get to the point where, where we redefine American identity in that way. Thank you. Um, Wendy, I want to give you a two part question that um, they're not so related, but I do want to make sure there's, there are two questions that are asked in the chat that I, I really value your perspective on. Um, one is when you make space for difference um, in your work and practice, how do you differentiate between differences in opinion that are constructive and differences in opinion that are aimed at destabilizing, aimed at hurting. So how do you, how do you balance um, that and kind of differentiate what types of differences we engage with? And then the second question um, I'll flag now and answer as you see fit is more practically, what types of spaces do you think we can make? So as we talk about building identities and building contact, what does that look like on the ground? And if you could give a couple insights from your experience and practice, that would be wonderful. Sure. I, I just wanted to also just say I, I agree with everything Michelle said. You know, I when I wake up in the morning, I rarely wake up and go, wow, I'm a Democrat and I'm an American. I never wake up thinking about those things. I don't. I wake up and I know that I'm a mom and I got to get my kids to school. I wake up knowing I'm a worker and I work at a certain place and I have to fulfill my obligation as an employee. I know that I'm a, a member of my condo board. And like, those are the identities that are far more salient to us. And I think if you just think about what are the identities that drive what you do every day, that's what's salient to Americans, right? We only think that we're Americans when we're, you know, being under attack or something like that. So, so I, I'm also a little um, um, ambivalent or, or, or cynical that we can create some perfect American identity that everybody's going to buy into, right? Like, I just don't think that happens unless there's a huge threat to that identity. Um, so that that would be the only thing I would add. I think, you know, it's funny working in the immigrant rights movement, the, the only people that I can that I get to spend the most time with are people who think like me and share my values uh, towards a, a more pro immigrant policy approach in the United States and being very open and 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 welcoming to, to migrants. Um, but but where I where I think I see the people that you can have conversations with is is when you do try to challenge some of those assumptions um, internally. You see people who are very inflexible to that, and have decided that that people that don't see our worldview the way we do they are you name it racist, xenophobic, hateful, and it doesn't matter you know how nuanced their position is or isn't. And so I mean I think I. I tend to just engage with people who I do see want to work on the complexity of the issue and do want to understand if we can find some sort of common ground. Those people exist in lower and lower levels all the time in my movement. And that's very concerning for me because I think that we also have to take responsibility for the polarization. It's not just the other side who's polarizing the issue. We are, we've, we've, we're angry. We're a bit radicalized from the last few years and we need to recognize that within our own with our own body. Um, and then the, on the second question, how do, we, how do we kind of realize this intergroup contact in a really big way? How do we scale this all over the country? Well, we need to work with the institutions that can scale it, right? So we need to work with the YMCAs. We do need to work with the American Alliance of Museums. We do need to work with you know, whoever is willing to sit down and say, now bridge building is part of my mandate. And I think there's an increasing number of large institutions in American life who do have the trust and the social capital and community that can help us realize that. But just knowing that, you know, that it's a new muscle sometimes. If you're a community service provider who thinks you provide charitable services to your community, that's good. But it's a bit of a new muscle to do bridge building work. And so that's why we need people like Linda and others to help folks build out how do you do intergroup contact that really is all the, that, that, that abides by all the principles of intergroup contact equal footing, you know, shared goals, you know, co continuous contact over time. 
But I think if you work with those large institutions, I think we can get there. And I think there's a lot of interest, but again, it, it'll take time. Thank you. Um, we are at one o'clock. Um, and so unfortunately our time together is closing, but uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, the panelists, of course, um, your insights and contributions are invaluable. Also to everyone who's been able to attend. And if you're catching this at a later time in the recording, um, thanks also for checking out the work. I really do encourage everyone uh, to take a look at the report. Um, there is a lot of depth and there's a lot of practical depth in the report that we didn't have the time to discuss today. And take a look, bring your own interventions to the table. Um, there's a lot of science and there's a lot of room for movement, but to solve these problems, it's a collective. I mean, we really do need everyone uh, to be on board for the challenge. So with that, um, thank you all for coming today and look forward to hopefully seeing everyone in person sometime soon.